Well, I've got a wonderful story to tell you, and I wanted to ask uh, before I got started if there is anyone in the audience that knew Joe Gerbrock personally. Well, we've got a couple in here that knew Joe Gerbrock, the movie mogul uh, in early Ames. Um, I grew up in Ames, and I certainly knew about Joe Gerbrock. Everybody knew about Joe Gerbrock. Um, the history of movie theaters in Ames started with Joe Gerbrock, but it was Joe that truly made history with movie houses in Ames. Joe launched his 50-year career in 1912, and when he retired in 1962, he had owned six theaters in Ames and was a witness to the most dramatic developments in the movie industry, silent to talkies to widescreen to 3D. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about his theater so that you know the context of all the shenanigans that he was pulling. But today's program really is about Joe the Promoter. And I'd like to acknowledge Joe's daughter, Jan, and her husband, Richard, for donating to the Ames Historical Society two thick scrapbooks, jam-packed, full of clippings and pictures documenting Joe's long years in, his, in, in the business. They are the basis for telling this amazing story from Ames history. Joe was born on a farm four miles south of Ames on September 27th, 1895. He had three siblings, Helen and Della, and a little brother named Wilford. <coughs> Joe was 12 years old in 1907 when K.H. Kahn opened the Scenic Theater at 121 Main. Growing up, the Jerbrock kids enjoyed many weekly films at the Scenic Theater. Four years later, 1911, ground was broken by attorney C.G. Lee for the Princess Theater at 117 Main, just two doors east of the Scenic Theater. A year after that, in 1912, Joe was an Ames High School senior when his father suggested to him and his two sisters that they go into business. With their father's $5,000 loan, Joe, Helen, and Della bought and refurbished the Scenic Theater and renamed it the Twin Star. Joe was the general manager handling bookings and advertising, Helen ran the box office, and Della played the piano to accompany silent films. <laughs> Helen and Della also sold tickets, ushered patrons, and made announcements. And Wilfred, of course, had to be a part of the scene. He handled all the odd jobs around the theater. The twin star with seating of 300 proved to be a paying venture. Joe was truly a great promoter. He was very inventive at attracting attention to get people into his theaters. During the early years, they held contests for fiddlers, Charleston dancers, and amateur performers. There were style shows and hair fashion shows, special events for college students and children, and humorous promotional stunts. In 1916, a special Christmas show was shown to 1,000 youngsters. Joe served in the Marine Corps during World War I, and when he returned to Ames in 1919, he and Helen bought out Della's business share. And then Joe and Helen bought the rival Princess Theater on East Main Street, so 1919, Joe was beginning to be the, mo the theater mogul of Ames. This is a wonderful shot of the east end of Main Street. Here's the princess, of course. There's the twin star. And uh, this building probably was most recently Pile Photo. And I know a number of you will remember Pile Photo. This building, whoops. This building is sort of in a state of flux. It's uh, owned and being extensively remodeled at the moment, and I don't think it's open to the public quite yet. <clears throat> in 1919, Joe added vaudeville to his theater's offerings, advertising live bathing beauties. Needless to say, local residents noticed and were vocal in their concern about what was going on on East End of Main Street. Woohoo! Look at those legs. When talk began about opening a theater in Campus Town in 1919, there was a feeling from the college that a theater would be a distraction for students. 
They really wanted to maintain the ivory tower atmosphere out on campus. After first limiting theaters to downtown, the Ames City Council reversed itself and permitted a movie theater in Campus Town. This resulted in the construction of the American Theater built in 19, 1919 by our friend, Mr. Champlin, who uh, uh, you saw just a little bit earlier. Uh, this is a great picture. Um, this is one of the only pictures we have of the theater when it was the American. Um, and uh, it did not have a marquee. So when uh, Joe Gerbrock bought it, um, the uh, marquee was added. And it was, uh, of course, it was renamed uh, uh, from the American to the Ames Theater. In 1926, Joe bought Helen's business share and became the sole owner of the Ames Theater Company. In April 1926, after extensive remodeling, the Princess was renamed the Capitol. Who remembers the Capitol? All right, all right, all right. In 1928, the Ames Theater in Campus Town underwent a major rebuilding to modernize and increase its uh, seating capacity, and it reopened as the new Ames Theater. By late 1928, movie tone and Vitaphone talking pictures were being presented at the new Ames. So this was the first new technology that Joe was really undertaking, talking movies. In 1936, Joe announced a new 1,000-seat theater building to be located on the north side of Main Street near Clark Avenue. As you would expect from an imaginative promoter, Joe ran a contest. Hang on just a second. Joe ran a contest to name the new theater. The idea had to have a direct connection with the college to recognize the predominant influence of the college on the city. It had to be musical in sound, easy to pronounce, adaptable for publicity purposes, and impossible to divide or nickname. And uh, some of these were very interesting. Here was a, um, an entry, Io Staco. <laughs> which was an abbreviation of Iowa State College, I-A-C-A, <laughs> unique to say the least. What? Drop the T off his name? Yeah. Now the 14-year-old uh, Norma Jean Ross won the $25 prize with her submission of The Collegian. When it opened in 1937, the Collegian was the largest theater in central Iowa outside of Des Moines. A beautiful Art Deco style building. Three days before the grand opening of the Collegian, the Twin Star showed its last picture on September 19th, 1937, after 26 years of presenting movies. Joe also announced that with the opening of the Collegian, the Capitol would discontinue matinees, but would be open evenings daily and afternoons and evenings on Saturdays and Sundays and holidays. The Capitol operated for 15 more years until April 1952. In 1938, Joe announced his intentions to build a second theater in Campus Town east of the new Ames. The varsity was des uh, designed by the same design team as the Collegian and seated 600 people. The varsity opened in September 1938 and movies were shown there until 2009. And you can see that it was sort of a miniature version of the, um, of the Collegian, a very Art Deco looking building. Most of this interesting brickwork was hidden by that uh, 1970s, that lovely 1970s facade that was put on the building. 
The construction of the ranch drive-in was announced in early 1949. It was built two and a half miles west of Ames on Highway 30 and opened July 7, 1949. Special events in addition to the movies included fireworks, contests, and ladies' nights. Family nights were Tuesdays where you could bring a whole carload of people for one dollar. And midnight shows were added on Saturdays. The ranch also had a complete set of playground equipment. The ranch drive-in screened movies through the 1995 season and then closed. Improvements at Joe's theaters were constant. They were noteworthy for their acoustics and quality sound, and equipment was always being upgraded to provide the best possible movie experience. Joe didn't want anyone to have a bad time at the movies, and he was constantly working to make the movie-going experience delightful. Joe undertook many projects that involved doing community good that, at the same time, yes, involved bringing people into his theaters. Maybe they were good deeds, but they maybe doubled as promotions as well. During the Depression in 1930, a theater party was sponsored by the Ames Theater Company and the Ames Tribune Times for drought victims of the southern state, also known as the Dust Bowl. 1,100 people attended two performances at the Capitol with food supplies as the only admission. The party exceeded estimates in the amount of food collected. During the Depression in 1931, a newspaper ad stated, quote, this country's leading educators assert that entertainment is as necessary to youngsters as shelter, clothing, and food. Good, clean entertainment is needed to sustain morale during these days of depression. Good movies are educational as well as entertaining, so send your kiddies to the movies often. Ten cents all times for kids at the Capitol. In 1934, Joe hosted children at a toy show at the Twin Star. The price of admission was an old or new toy for the American Legion's campaign for gifts for needy children. Down there in the corner is the thank you note. They were quite successful. In 1942, during World War II, the Story County quota for war bonds was $2,215,800. Joe was the Zone 6 drive director. Movie stars Gene Tierney and Chester Morris were touring, and Joe brought the stars to Ames from Des Moines. They participated in a parade and later were available to autograph war bonds that were purchased. Jean Tierney was a beautiful woman, and she was called Hollywood's Mona Lisa. During the fourth war bond campaign in 1944, the motion picture industry set a goal of a bond for every seat in every theater, 1.1 million. In Ames, there was a free movie day for anyone who bought a bond. One of Joe's theaters was the designated drop-off place during a scrap metal drive during World War II. Looks like the capital to me. In 1944, the National Clothes for Russia drive occurred to assist 80 million destitute Russians during, uh, returning to their devastated homes after the German retreat. In Ames, Joe chaired the drive that netted 25,000 pounds of clothing, more clothes on a population basis than any other city in Iowa. Joe gave free shows at all his theaters in conjunction with the drive. Now this was interesting. In 1953, Joe cooperated with the Ames Ministerial Association and offered the ranch drive-in for 7 a.m. sunrise church services in June, July, and August. This generated goodwill and was a model to other theater owners. Joe got some kind of award for doing this. In the 1950s were the annual summer playground program parades. 
These parades would go from the band shell to the collegian and all the kids were treated to a movie. Participants including children enrolled in crafts, baseball, swimming, tennis, storytelling, day camp, drama, and square dancing. And of course there was also a costume contest that uh, brought the kids up on stage and Joe awarded the prizes. Get those kids coming to the movies early. Um, also in the 1950s, local merchants in the Chamber of Commerce hosted thousands of youngsters in Ames theaters for a special program opening the December holiday season. It was a Saturday event and Santa was on hand to hear child wishes. Mothers were told to leave their children at the theaters while they were shopping. Boy, you'd never get that today, but <laughs> instant babysitting on Saturday morning. Joe was very generous with Iowa State students. He allowed displays for homecoming and other events in front of the theaters, and he flashed campus event announcements on the screen for free. Sometimes he let students sell theater tickets and keep a percentage of the sales. And he let student performing groups practice before a live audience in his theaters between showings. If good behavior was demonstrated during the football season, it was rewarded at the end of the season with a free show lasting all afternoon and evening. During World War II, Joe provided two free shows a week for Navy trainees who were in residence on the Iowa State campus. These were the V-12s. A naval training student named Walt Early wrote to his parents in Providence, Rhode Island in 1944. Dear Mom and Dad, I just came back from a free movie over in Dogtown, which was really pretty good. We are all allowed to go to a free movie in town every Monday night as guests of the theater manager. Not too bad. Joe never missed an opportunity to promote the movies and was very inventive and creative in what he did to draw attention to his theaters. In the scrapbooks that were gifted to us, we found several renditions of brainstorming lists, some typed, some handwritten, and all of them containing several dozen ideas. In 1944, an interview, uh, a 1944 interview marked Joe's 32nd anniversary as a showman, and in it he recalled some of his top stunts, as he called them. Some of them backfired, he admits, but they turned out to be swell attention getters. Some of them even better than I'd planned. An early stunt was having someone lead a goat in a college parade. The goat was to have a sign that said, don't let the blues get your goat, attend the show. It was a good idea, but then Joe had a terrible time finding a goat until Al Batman loaned him a goat with the understanding that the goat was to be returned in the same condition as when he got it. <laughs> now this is a sign promoting the cool Capitol Theater. It looks like it might have been at Carr's Pool. And then this was a very uh, extravagant window display in the, uh, at, in the front of the Twin Star. Again, a big uh, um, poster uh, promoting the air conditioning in his theater. And I love this. This is at the Capitol. Leave your guns here. I suppose, you know, the Capitol showed all kinds of westerns and shoot 'em up type films. And I suppose all the little cowpokes were encouraged to leave their guns out in the lobby. That's what it looked like to me. Uh, somehow, Joe managed to borrow an army personnel carrier to promote the film Battleground, which was uh, circulating in the movie theaters in 1949. And here's Joe tooling around in a Model T with his daughter, Jan. Uh, I don't know what movie he was promoting, but it had to be something. Why else would Joe be tooling around town in a Model T? This was really something. In 1930, on New Year's Eve, a wedding was held at the New Ames Theater. Joe arranged with 40 Ames merchants to donate a complete outfit for the newly wedded couple. The couple selected was one Joe thought to be the most eligible of several couples who asked to be considered. 
The two had planned to be married after graduation, but they couldn't pass up the chance at the hope chest full of gifts. The, this was New Year's Eve, remember, the 11 p.m. ceremony was held between features. Imagine that. The wedding as a show stunt was successful, Joe says, but he admitted that he didn't know whether the couple lived happily ever after. But he added, they should have, though. <laughs> Yeah, how about this one? On another occasion, Joe conceived the idea of presenting a real live baby as a gift from the stage to the holder of the lucky ticket. This aroused anger and legal action was threatened, but Joe was adamant. This baby is from a very fine family and its mother can't take care of it much longer. The baby was rolled out in a baby buggy dolled up in pink ribbon. The audience gasped with laughter when the baby turned out to be a baby pig. <laughs> I'll bet the theater was packed that night. <coughs> On one occasion, Joe wanted to stress the high quality of his movies. He hired a stuntman and put him up on stilts that placed the man's head on the level with second story windows on Main Street. He held a sign that said high in quality and listed the names of upcoming movies. All went well until an angry woman called Joe to say, he's looking through my windows. <laughs> to advertise the movie Black Box, Joe had a giant box kite built to carry a three by 30 foot banner that was some kite, said Joe. It was capable of lifting about 75 pounds and we put it in up in the morning and it stayed up all day. But once school was out, a kid lured away one of the guards and the next thing we knew, the cord was cut and away went our kite. On another occasion, Joe hired a midget to act the part of Charlie Chaplin. Cane, mustache, shoes, the walk, everything. Little Charlie paraded Ames streets for a morning, but about noon made a technical error by walking by the central school. Joe happened to drive by about that time, and there stood the little person in his underwear with tears streaming down his face. The kids had stripped him of almost all of his clothes for souvenirs. <laughs> For the movie Shepherd of the Hills, Joe rented six sheep and put them in a pen out in front of the theater. The first thing he knew, there was a lot of noise in front of the picture show. He went out and found no sheep. The sheep were going up the street, one, each one in the arms of a very husky college student. <laughs> Joe finally rounded up all of them except one, which he assumed was probably ended up as uh, lamb stew the next day. Two stunts with airplanes got Joe noticed throughout the nation. The first happened when Joe wanted to attract attention to one of the first movies in which an airplane played an important part. He took his own plane up and began doing rolls. He had a coat lying in the vacant seat and out it fell. When he landed, he went to the Tribune office and placed an ad. Joe said it was one of the first ads in history for something that had been lost from a plane. Happily, someone found the coat in a cornfield and he actually got it back. Perhaps the most serious backfire of a stunt involved a flight by Joe and brother Wilford on the morning before a college football game. Joe thought it would be a good idea to bomb the college and the city with handbills. On the ground, they tested a homemade bomb uh, made around a bunch of circulars and set it off and noted with satisfaction that the circulars were spread over quite a wide area. On the flight about 2,000 feet up, Joe tossed another such bomb over the side of the plane. It promptly caught in the slipstream, flew back to the tail, lodged there and exploded as planned. It blew our ship into a spin and took off most of the tail coverings, Joe said, and scared us to death. We did have enough covering to get back to port, and we did succeed in attracting quite a lot of attention. 
1930 Popularity Queen Contest was held the Saturday of homecoming. Nine local merchants donated prizes with a Brunswick radio as the grand prize. Merchants gave out vote coupons that had to be dropped in theater lobbies. The winner was announced at the new Ames Theater to a packed house. After the movie, the radio was carried out onto the stage and a little girl dressed as the queen from Radio Heaven in a white crepe paper costume and crown knighted the winner with her wand. In 1949, the Miss Iowa State Freshman Contest was held in conjunction with the premiere of a new Loretta Young movie, Mother is a Freshman. Contestants were judged on academics, activities, and artistic talents. At the premiere, the queen and two runner-ups appeared on stage at the Collegian with Hollywood-style pomp and ceremony. Prizes included $100 cash and a $100 wardrobe and the chance to win a one-week trip to Hollywood. Woohoo! In the late 1950s, there uh, were a hula hoop contest, a Tribune published picture coloring contest, an event featuring the first runner-up to Miss America, and a style show with the theme, You Can Buy It in Ames at the Collegian. At the Ranch Drive-In was an appearance by Russell Smith and his show horse, King. In 1960, a picture caption in the Tribune said, quote, shoppers in Ames Friday may have imagined that they had been transported to a muddy track at Santa Anita or Hialeah when they saw the famous racehorse Seabiscuit coming down the Main Street approach. The fact that the life story of the famous horse forms the background of the movie that opens at the Collegian on, Saturday, on Sunday had plenty to do with this unusual scene. Seabiscuit, right in our town. Joe had a good relationship with the Tribune and a number of shared promotions involved free movie tickets with the purchase of a new subscription. But there were many other joint ventures. In 1931, Joe and the Tribune sponsored the Halloween Good Conduct Awards. Children between the ages of eight and 14 who agreed to conduct themselves in a peaceful manner on Halloween night and whose parents or guardians would certify that good behavior would be given a free ticket to a Capitol Theater matinee of Zane Gray's Rider of the Purple Sage in a new episode of Our Gang as well as a cartoon. A pledge coupon was published in the paper. 850 kids responded. Police Chief Cure thought the campaign was very effective as no actual property damage was reported that Halloween. The Tribune and the Ames Theater Company also sponsored the birthday club for kids under the age of 14. They registered at the Tribune for a membership card and then, during the child's birthday month, brought in a birthday coupon that had been clipped from the paper and exchanged it for a theater pass to a once a month party at the Capitol. On one National Newspaper Boys Day, 175 newsboys for the Des Moines Register and Ames Tribune attended free movies on a Saturday and were treated to popcorn and sweets. In 1953, a contest for high school students was sponsored by the theater company, The Tribune and KASI Radio. Cash prizes were given to write an essay on why I like to go to the movies. The letters were printed in The Tribune or read on KASI. In 1953, the Ames Theatre Company and the Tribune co-sponsored the Chuckle Ad Contest that attracted an enthusiastic response. Instructions were to take the want ad section of the Tribune and use three, four, or five whole lines from various advertisements and put them together in a new way so that they had a new and amusing meeting. meaning. Free theater tickets were the prizes to three daily winners. Several winning ads read, Western Style Saddle, Ride to and from Des Moines, Automatic Heat on Paved Street. Here's another one. Sewing and altering of homegrown African violets or working men on the bus line. 
Here's another one. Large size, very good condition bookkeeper, 21 to 35, to work acres of land eight miles north of Ames. <laughs> Joe regularly sent free season passes to prominent citizens, including the school superintendent, church pastors, the mayor, the college president, and many more. In 1949, all members of the fire and police departments and their wives and children were guests of the Ames Theater Company at a Christmas theater party. The most successful program was Bank Night. Joe said it was almost a religion with some people to attend Bank Night. Uh, they would, people would go without meals, get up from sick beds, postpone one out of town trips uh, just to be able to come. Invented in 1931, Bank Night was a popular lottery game during the Great Depression. In 1936, Bank Night was played at 5,000 of America's 15,000 active theaters, and copies of the game were played at countless more. The popularity of Bank Night and similar schemes contributed to the resiliency of the film industry during the Great Depression. Joe used Bank Night to draw people to movies during the week, usually a Tuesday or Thursday. Money was added to the jackpot on a regular basis. When a person bought a theater ticket, they were given a bank night entry form that was dropped into a drawing box. The form stayed in the box until it was drawn, so there was more than one chance to win. On bank night, name drawing was a formal affair with lots of splash and drama, during which a name would be pulled from the box at random. The person selected had to be present to win and had to reach the stage within a set amount of time to claim their prize. Many people did buy tickets in order to be present, but some would just gather on the sidewalk and the ushers would come to the door and call out the name, giving that person an opportunity to buy a ticket, enter the theater, and then race to the stage to claim the prize. <laughs> if there were no winners, then the, the jackpot grew. The $300 in this slide was big money for the time. Now the fad began to encounter legal problems and it lost much of its popularity by the 1930s, but it generated an enormous amount of business for theaters during the time period. Show business was Joe's life work. He developed the properties of the Ames Theater Company into the finest theater facilities in the Midwest. And in spite of many adversities, problems, and competition, he made a huge success of it. At his retirement in 1962, he was one of the three oldest businesses in Ames under one management. Although none of the theaters that Joe um, owned is still operating today, the impact he had on the development of our community is immeasurable. In many ways, he is a model of a creative, hardworking businessman, an active and engaged citizen who used his resources for both private and public good. And so we leave Joe, the promoter. Thank you. Does anybody have any comments or questions? Janet? I just want to know the name of the movie that was too hot to play in Kansas City. <laughs> Oh no, I didn't notice that headline. I'm not sure. Your hometown. Yeah. Oh, oh, thank you for asking. Joe um Joe actually legally had his, his name changed. Um he he was kind of superstitious. And on one of his trips to Hollywood, he um met with um uh, like a fortune teller. And she told Joe that he would be more successful if he dropped the T in his last name and added the initial V as a middle name. And so um, Joe, you know, didn't want to take any chances <laughs> about affecting his luck. Um, and so when he came back to Ames, he legally changed his name. He added V, v period as a middle initial <clears throat> and formally dropped the T on his last name. So you're right, there was that change. There was, there was one slide you had up there that had both versions on the plane, and I think the airfield <laughs> went, went on with the T because Wolford didn't change his name. Right, right. right. And then the story had his name without the T. Yeah. yeah. So that was 1936, so it happened probably. 
in that. Right, about in that time period. I didn't bring my notes on that. I could tell you the exact year, but I can't think of it right off the top of my head. Yeah, Tom. Kathy, do you know uh, somewhere around 1957, uh, more or less, uh, Joe got in bad odor with college students. I don't know what it was, but he'd come into a basketball game at the armory, and the students would all boo him. Do you have any idea what that was about? Well, I, I have a suspicion. Uh, I was taught the one slide where I was talking about how he was good to college students, and if they behave themselves during the football season, then he would give them a free show all day. Well, he decided one year he wasn't going to do that anymore. And the students came to the theater expecting a free show, and he told them, no dice this year. It's not, it's not going to happen. And the students rioted. <laughs> they, uh, and they damaged, they caused a lot of damage to the theater. <coughs> And I think it was about that time period. So if he fell out of favor, that may have been the reason. <laughs> I don't know whether he repeated it. No, no, it would not. Any other questions or comments? Can I ask another one? Yeah, go ahead. I, I've heard the last two rows uh, for cars at the Ranch Drivers didn't have any speakers. Is that true? <laughs> Did you hear the question? He heard the last two rows of the ranch drive and didn't have any speakers. Is that true? I have no idea. What it, Dell says, yeah, they didn't need them. They were doing something else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Denny. Yeah, several slides. Halloween had a hype in it. Yeah. Oh. Just common practice. Uh, you know, it's short for Hallow's Eve. You know, it's a contraction. So maybe that was a time when they were actually still recognizing the original, the origins of the word. Isn't it? I remember going to the Twin Star and they had the piano player for the music. And that was part of the good, part of the show was hearing that piano play along with the movie. I'm so impressed that we have someone here who remembers the piano player at the Twin Star. Oh my gosh. They were mostly Western cowboy shows. Right. Right. Do you remember how old you were? Probably seven, eight, nine. Seven, eight, or nine years old. The Twin Star. Um, she remembers going to the Twin Star and hearing the piano player accompanying the silent films. And she's thinking she was seven, eight, or nine years old at that time. So that's an amazing memory. Wow. <laughs> I wonder if it was Della Gerbrock playing the piano. Any other comments or questions? Uh, please help yourself to wonderful refreshments at the back of the room, and thank you so much for coming this morning.